All right, as we continue in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to be looking at the subject of heavenly wisdom versus human wisdom. And we should all desire that wisdom from above. We should all desire to have the mind of Christ. Amen? Amen. So last week we ended in chapter 2 with verses 4 and 5 where Paul says, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He continues in verse six. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Let's open in prayer. Our Father, we look to you this morning and we look to your word. Pray that you would lead us and teach us through your Holy Spirit. Give us spiritual wisdom to discern the things of God. And as we will see this morning, the things of God can only be discerned by those who have the spirit of God. Give to us and maintain in us the mind of Christ, and may all that is said and done lift and exalt Christ, because he is the Lord of glory. We pray it all in his name. Amen. Amen. Human wisdom is achieved by studying, working hard, earning degrees, gaining that worldly wisdom, etc., but spiritual wisdom and we're not against some of those things, but spiritual wisdom is acquired through the Spirit. That's what the Bible says. Now, in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Now, when people hear the word mystery, they usually think of something that is puzzling, something that is difficult, if not impossible to understand. But when we see that, word in the Bible is talking about uh, something in the New Testament. When you see that word, it's talking about something that God has kept hidden from ages past. But now in the New Testament, he is revealing that mystery through his spirit, something that wasn't understood in Old Testament times. But now God is making it clear through the spirit, through his word. So an example of this would be the New Testament church. Before Jesus came and established the church before the day of Pentecost. Before that, the church was a mystery. People in the Old Testament, they did not understand it. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, marriage is a picture of the church. And that's something that people never would have thought of. But he says, I speak this. He says, this is a great mystery that marriage is actually a picture of the church. So the church was a mystery in Old Testament times. They didn't understand it. They didn't understand how Jew and Gentile, because they thought it was all about the nation of Israel, they didn't understand how Jew and Gentile would be brought together in one body, the body of Christ. Now the thing about a mystery is, once it's been revealed, then you start to understand. It's like a mystery novel, or you're watching a movie with a mysterious plot, you don't really understand what's going on at that moment, right? As you're going through, it's puzzling. You don't understand it, but at the end, hopefully, everything's made clear, and then you can look back and see how everything fits together. Uh, hindsight is 2020. So hopefully, the point is, hopefully, this is what the Spirit of God is doing in your life. He's opening your eyes opening your eyes to spiritual things, opening your eyes to heavenly wisdom and to the mysteries of God. And this is a great passage. Uh, for those of us who have the spirit of God, I pray that's every person in this room. 
But those who have the Spirit of God, God is revealing what? Heavenly wisdom. And this wisdom is preparing us, preparing us for what's to come and for the world to come. He says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8, take a look at that. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Do you love God? You can't even imagine the things that God has prepared for you. Now that verse is a quote from Isaiah 64, where it's talking about how man did not know God, but for those who do, God is preparing them. He is preparing us for what's to come by giving us wisdom from above. Now you compare that heavenly wisdom with human wisdom. Human wisdom, at least... In today's day and age, human wisdom says you evolve from the slime, you're headed nowhere, and there's really no meaning to life. I mean, that's essentially what human wisdom is, is saying. So, hey, enjoy the time you got because you're going to die and that's it. And there's no meaning to life. Hey, great. Thanks. Thanks for that. That's human wisdom. <laughs> Compare that with heavenly wisdom, which says you were created in the image of God. And there is a meaning to life, and God has a plan, he has a purpose, he is preparing you for what is to come. Which would you rather have? In verse 6, Paul admits, talking about wisdom, he had a simple message. When Paul came to town, he didn't seem all that impressive, some people. He admits he had a simple message. But he did speak wisdom. He spoke some of the deeper things among those who were mature. And he's talking about being spiritually mature. But he says he spoke the wisdom, but not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are what? Coming to nothing. They are passing away. And you think about some of the great cultures and the empires throughout human history. Where are they now? Socrates and Aristotle and Plato, where are they now? When 1 Corinthians was written, the Roman Empire ruled the world. And uh, where's the Roman Empire now? You know, people travel to Europe to see the ruins of it, right? So, and that's interesting. You go and you can see the ruins of the Roman Empire, but guess what? The kingdom of God is still expanding all over this world. What Caesar tried to do, he failed, but God's doing it. He's doing it. So what did the Roman Empire believe? Speaking of the rulers of this age or of that age, essentially what they believed, uh, and you probably heard this statement before, essentially might makes right. They had the power. They could do whatever they wanted. And what did they do? They exalted man. They sought after sinful pleasures and the empire eventually fell, but how did the Roman Empire fall? Well, one of the big reasons was moral decay. You look at any history book, you listen to any lecture on this, they all talk about the moral decay of the Roman Empire. And we look around us today, what is that great political and military power of this age? There's no question about it, it is the United States of America, and I think we're seeing that same thing. We are seeing moral decay, and some people are blind to it, but any spirit-filled Christian, they see it clear as day. So the rulers of this world, they always reject the truth. Uh, the Jewish nation in Bible times, they had the truth, but what did they do? They strayed from it. We have the truth today, but our nation is straying from it. Uh, Israel, they were blinded by their traditions. And when the Lord of glory, the one they were waiting for, when he came full of grace and truth, when he came teaching that a man should love his neighbor and even love his enemy, when he came and healed the sick and gave sight to the blind and preached the gospel to the poor and the outcast, what did they do? What was his reward for that? He was nailed to a cruel cross. Why? Well, the reason that Paul gives here, he says, because the rulers of this age, they lacked wisdom. They lacked heavenly wisdom because if they had known, if they had understood, they would not have crucified the Lord 
of glory. So that's the reason Paul gives. They lacked heavenly wisdom. They didn't understand. Or they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They did not know God. They did not understand the things of God. Now, if there's one thing I want everyone here to get this morning, it's this. There are two roads. This is very simple. There are only two roads. There are only two kingdoms. And there is only two types of of wisdom. There is the road to glory, the road to destruction. There is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. There is heavenly wisdom and human wisdom. If a person rejects Christ and his teachings, they are on the road to destruction. They are blinded by the God of this world, that is the devil, and they are rejecting that heavenly wisdom. And this is why They hated, and people today, they hate the biblical Christ. They've made this other Jesus, who's a figment of their imagination, but when, and they'll say all these other things about him, but if you actually go to what the Bible says, they hate the biblical Christ. The rulers of this age, they praise God with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. Don't be deceived. They hate the biblical Christ. Christ. They lack heavenly wisdom. Now, there are a lot of people, even in churches, they, they say they are Christians and they don't always act like it. You know, in the Corinthians, they were guilty of this. And to some extent, you know, honestly, we're all guilty of this. One of the biggest complaints against the church is that the church is filled with hypocrites. You've heard this, right? Maybe, maybe you even said it at one point in your life. You know, and I've been thinking about that because they will interview people and they say they don't, well, why don't you attend church? And they say the, the numbers are declining, declining, declining. Why don't you go? The church is filled with hypocrites. And someone once said, well, hey, there's room for one more. I don't really like that <laughs> response. But honestly, the only way to avoid hypocrisy is to either be perfect, which nobody is, or to have zero standards, zero morality. You know, we're Christians, we have some of the highest standards. And yeah, it's true, we fail to live up to them sometimes. The Corinthian church, remember the first sermon we said, were these people lost? No, they were saved. They had the spirit of God, but they were falling Sure, the Corinthian church was falling short. That's why Paul wrote this letter to them. But they acknowledged and they understood the truth. Even though they were not always living up to it, they acknowledged and they understood the truth. You see, Paul had something to work with. If you believe and acknowledge the truth, we got something to work with here. God has something to work with. But on the Other side, if someone doesn't acknowledge the truth, there's nothing there. So yes, there are true Christians who fail at times. Uh, They have the heavenly wisdom, they just don't always put it into practice, right? So there are true believers who at times appear to be more carnal than they are spiritual. That is true. Uh, But there are those who claim Christ, but again, they have rejected the Christ of scripture in favor of making a God of their own imagination. I really believe this is the biggest issue in the church today, making a God, fashioning a God of your own imagination. Turn to Isaiah 44. And by the way, that's not a very wise thing to do. So one of the biggest problems in the church today is where people think they know better than God. Paul says something about that. You know, who has been his counselor? People think they know better than God. They reject heavenly wisdom in favor of human wisdom. And they reject the true God in favor for one they have shaped and molded in their own minds. Now here in Isaiah 44, we see a crass example of this, this form of idolatry, because in the Old Testament, there were many people who claimed to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
But in reality, again, they were worshiping a God of their own making. So let's take a look at Isaiah 44, starting in verse 13. The craftsman stretches out his rule, and he marks one out with chalk, and he fashions it with a plane. He marks it out with the compass, and he makes it like the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. He cuts down cedars for himself and takes the cypress and the oak. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn. He will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a God and worships it. He makes it a carved image and he falls down to it. You think, you see what's going on here? He burns half of it in the fire. With this half, he eats his meat. He roasts a roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it, he makes into a god. His carved image. He falls down before it and worships it. And he prays to it. And says, deliver me, for you are my God. They do not know nor understand, for he, that is God, the real God, has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. And no one considers in his heart, nor is their knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire. Yes, I have also baked bread on its coals. I have roasted meat and eaten it. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? So you see what's happening here. A man, he goes out of the woods, he cuts down a tree and he takes half of that wood, starts a fire He's keeping warm, he's cooking his food, and then with that leftover block of wood, he carves out an idol and he worships it. He worships a block of wood. Now we look at that, the average response is, that is crazy. This man is insane, you have to be crazy to believe that, or to do that. How can a man think a pine tree is his God? But is that really what he believed? Isn't he aware of the fact that it's a block of wood? He's the one who cut the thing down. Of course he knows it's a block of wood. So this really is not insanity. It's not craziness. What it is, it's pagan religion. It's idolatry. It's superstition. And you say, well, people back then, most people look at this and they think, well, people back then, they were just kind of dumb. Right? You've heard this. You've thought this. People thousands of years ago, they were just not very intelligent. I'll tell you what. There are more people today who do this type of thing than there was back then. Just as many, and if not more, because of the world's population, there's definitely more people who do it. So many religions incorporate graven images, rituals, superstitions, mantras, incantations, that block of wood represents the spirit that they are worshiping. So in ancient times, Israel, you remember the golden calf? Everyone knows the story of the golden calf. Same thing. So in ancient times, they would take the truth, right? They take the truth and they mix it with error or maybe heavenly wisdom with human wisdom. Let's mix it up. They would take the truth and mix it with error. They would take the name of God and then bring in idols to represent that God. Now, fast forward, and of course, God explicitly told them not to do that, and we know that today. But fast forward to modern times. Do people do this today? There are many religions. They have their idols. There's one in town. But there are churches, Christian churches, as they say, and I think most of you know this, there are still at least one or two that still use graven images. The churches are filled with them. So you have that issue. But then you have many professing Christians who would never even think about falling down and worshiping a block of wood. They would never do that in a million years. But what do they do? They take truth 
and they mix it together with error. They take the name of God and they subscribe to him thoughts and attitudes that do not belong to him. Thoughts and attitudes that are not in this book. You want heavenly wisdom? Right here. Right here. We said, well, it's through the Spirit. The Spirit wrote this book. So where do people get these ideas? Where they subscribe or they uh, give these um, thoughts and ideas to God? They say, this is what God thinks. You ever run into someone who said, well, I believe God would do this. Well, I think God thinks this way. Well, how'd you come to that conclusion? Well, that's what I think. Where'd they get that idea? Did this knowledge and wisdom come from heaven or from humans? Well, it came from humans. And of course, Romans chapter one, if you want homework during the week, read Romans chapter one. It speaks to this issue very well. So man takes his own wisdom, human wisdom, and he takes those things and he exalts it, right? Whatever I think, that's what God thinks. You say, well, Pete, no one would do that. Yeah, they do it every day, right? Well, I think that's what God thinks. Man worships and serves the creature rather than the creator. And instead of allowing God to shape and mold us, people try to shape and mold God into what they think he ought to be. Now go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, remember, I'm going to try to bring this all together here. Remember, the Jews had Jesus crucified because they believed he was a blasphemer. He was going against Moses, speaking against the law, speaking against the temple. It wasn't true, but that's what they said. The Romans, they agreed to crucify Jesus. Why? Because supposedly he had spoken against Caesar. Jesus claimed to be a king. There's no king but Caesar. Remember, that's what the Jews cried out. We have no king but Caesar. Of course, they didn't really believe that. They, they hated Caesar. They just wanted to see Jesus dead. So Jesus was seen from the Jews and the Romans as being an insurrectionist and a blasphemer. But that's not what he did. He wasn't guilty of any of those things. Jesus never spoke against Moses. He never intended to destroy the law. And he never intended to get enough followers to overthrow Herod, Pilate, or the Roman Empire. He never did those things. Now, some of his disciples, they wanted him to do that, right? They wanted to lead a revolt against the Romans. Some of them did. But Jesus didn't go along with it. So they took their own ideas, this is the point, they took their own ideas and imposed them upon Jesus. People do that all the time. And when Jesus spoke against those ideas, when he rebuked some of those ideas, either the people just ignored it or they stopped following him. Now back in the day when Jesus and the disciples walked the earth, you say, well, what, is Je what was Jesus like? Well, you could probably go and see. Or you could go and talk to his apostles and you say, well, how do we know? Uh, how did they know? You could go to them and talk to them and observe them. How do you know what the disciples preach? You could just listen to them if you were in that part of the world back then. But today, how do we know? How do we know? Well, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. How are we supposed to receive and understand this heavenly knowledge and wisdom? 1 Corinthians 2.10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So the Holy Spirit is the only one who knows everything about God. Because the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of God. Just like you, there's only one person one being in this world, other than the Lord, that knows everything about you. You say, well, my wife or my husband knows me inside and out, but they can't read your mind. You may think you have a friend and you know everything about, there's only one person who really knows everything about you, and that is your spirit. Look at verse 11. For what man knows, or for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. 
So the Spirit of God knows everything about God, and what is he doing? He is revealing those things to us. Remember what I said last week about the Word and the Spirit. God reveals himself to us through Word and Spirit. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 6. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of the spirit. So the Bible is God-breathed. These are spiritual words. So if you want that wisdom, you have to be in the word and you have to follow the leading of the spirit. The words of the scripture are life. And what does that mean? What does it mean? I say, okay, follow the leading of the spirit. What does that mean? Is that mysterious? See, it, that's a mystery to some people. I don't know how to do that. I don't know what that means. Listen, know this book, apply that book. God, and there's gonna be times where, how do I do this? How do I react? God will show you. But you need to know this book. You need to know what God has said. So the words of scripture are life, spirit and truth. Now, if you believe the words of scripture, and of course, that's the key, you have to believe it. If you don't believe, you don't receive the spirit. But if you believe them and you receive them and you obey them, you will be indwelt by the spirit of God. And when you open the scripture, God illuminates these words. There are people, they open the Bible and say, well, I can't, I can't understand that. And usually the... The solution, well, you know, you're reading the King James. Get the NIV. You'll understand it easier. Well, it might work for some people, but you know what? That's not really the solution. Be in the word more. Don't spend five minutes, scratch your head, and give up. Well, I, I can't understand it. It takes effort. It takes effort. God will give you the wisdom. He needs to see that effort from you. Verse 12, take a look at verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man wisdom teaches, but, in the, but the words that the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Okay, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, if someone says they know the Lord or they believe in Jesus, but the, the things they're saying don't line up with this book, <laughs> again, it's another, it's another Jesus. It's another Jesus. Or they believe in a gospel. A lot of people talk about the gospel. The word gospel is constantly coming out of their mouth, but I'm not hearing any gospel there. You, you ever notice that? They say the word gospel, but they're not actually preaching the gospel. So if they have a gospel of um, salvation by faith plus works or faith plus anything else, that's another gospel. Another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. And I'd have to say that's probably the majority, just like in the Old Testament, you say, prove it. In the Old Testament, was it the majority that was following the Lord or was it the remnant? In the New Testament, was it the majority that believed in Christ or was it the minority? It's always been that way, always. So if someone says they know Jesus, but it doesn't line up with this book, or they have spiritual wisdom, but it doesn't line up with this book, it's not really heavenly wisdom. Or, and that's why these people always reject the clear teachings of scripture, or they deny that the Bible is the inerrant and infallible word of God. And those who reject the Bible, they reject the spirit of God. There are some people who can't understand the book because they don't have the spirit of God. Therefore, they're rejecting the spirit and they're rejecting life. Verse 14 but the natural man, referring to unsaved people, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So Christians look at the scripture, we look at the scripture, and we love it. We understand it. Now, it's not to say that we understand everything. The Bible is a deep book. It, 
searches the things of God, we're never going to know everything. That's not the point. But we can understand the scripture. We love the scripture. We want to apply and live by the scripture. But other people, they look at the Bible and the teachings of the Bible, and they think it's foolishness, absolute foolishness. Here's a clear example. God created the heavens and the earth in six days. That's what the Bible says. And the majority of this world says that is foolish. And then you have us believers looking at Darwinism and evolution. And what do we think? That's foolish, right? Both sides are just coming from opposite. So it, one of two things is true. Either God is true and every man a liar. Or man is true and this book is full of lies. Take your pick. It's one or the other. Heavenly wisdom or human wisdom. Those are the only two options. Now, <clears throat> if you believe the scripture, if you hold to the teachings of the Bible and you apply them and you let people know that, people are going to look at you and say, yeah, that's foolish, and they're going to judge you, okay? And a lot of people in this world just say, well, don't judge. Judge not. Don't make any judgments. It's been my experience. The people who say that are just as judgmental as everybody else just about different things is what it boils down to. Okay, so there will be people who will judge you, but there's good news about that. Take a look at verse 15. If you are spiritual, if you have the spirit, and that's what Paul is doing, he's calling upon the Corinthians to be spiritual, not carnal. He says in verse 15, and I love this verse, but he who is spiritual judges all things. So if you have the spirit of God, you can judge all things. You know right from wrong, truth from error. He who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. What does that mean? For those who are walking with the Lord, who can lay a charge against God's elect? Now, if you're doing, if you're in sin, then people can bring a charge. They look at what he's doing. It's wrong. But he who is spiritual judges all things. If you're walking with the Lord, no one's got anything against you. Now, they may bring things against you. They brought accusations against Christ. But was he guilty? No. And God justified him. And God will justify you if you're walking with him. Amen. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of of Christ. So the spiritual man can judge all things because he has the mind of God. You have the mind of God, the mind of Christ. So the Corinthian church, they had the spirit. That's true. They had the spirit. But what were they doing? It's the carnal church, right? That's sort of the theme of the book of first Corinthians. They had the spirit. But what were they doing? They were grieving the spirit. So are we grieving the spirit? Or are we walking in the power of the Spirit? Will you be in the Word this week? Or will it be sitting on the shelf collecting dust? See, I'm, I'm, I'm stepping on some toes here. It's going to be there collecting dust. I should show up at someone's house and go to their bookshelf and just... I'm, I'm not going to do that. You won't come back. But you, you want to know why the Bible remains a mystery to some people? Because they don't pick it up. They don't read it. How do we know what God's will for our life is? Be in the word. Follow the leading of the Spirit.